Okay, welcome all to class. We'll begin. Can, uh, can I ask uh, Tarun, can you lead us in prayer, please? It's all right for you. Can you lead us in prayer? Uh, sure, a little bit of background noise, but I can no lead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this um, time where we could learn things uh, together. Father, we pray for your leading and your wisdom to guide us uh, uh, as we learn. We thank you uh, for this time. We invite uh, your spirit to take complete control and teach us the things that we really need to learn. Lord. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Tarun. Could hear uh, the sun in the background. Yeah, it's around me. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're looking at uh, Romans chapter 4. Okay, we began looking at Romans chapter 4 um, and I said in the introduction last week that uh, you know, we divide this, uh, this chapter 4 into two main sections. Uh, in one section, you know, Paul establishes um, uh, that faith okay, came before the law and the covenants and he uses the example of Abraham. Uh, and why does he use the example of Abraham is because, um, you know, uh, every Jew, for every Jew, Abraham was their, their father, their patriarch. Uh, so he says that Abraham had faith and he received uh, this righteousness by faith. He received it even before he received the law or uh, the circumcision, uh, which is a sign of the covenant even before these two things, law and circumcision, uh, he had faith and he was justified by faith or he was made righteous by uh, faith. Uh, so Paul is saying that so both circumcision and law came after the faith um, and uh, you know he's saying that um, you know we need to walk in the faith of uh, Abraham. So he's getting their attention uh, and catching their attention by keeping an example of Abraham. Now, another part of chapter four, he is giving us insights into uh, Abraham's faith. Uh, what he's saying in the second section, the second half of uh, Romans chapter four, is that uh, faith is what both Jew and a Gentile must walk in. Okay, so whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, you have to walk in the faith of Abraham. It's not keeping the law, it's not circumcision. Uh, it's not even your conscience, but it is, uh, you know, it is walking in the faith of Abraham. Then he talks about Abraham's faith in God and he says, this is how we, you know, whether we are Jews or Gentiles or Greeks must have faith in uh, God. Okay, so we just see how amazingly Paul is uh, expressing, uh, sorry, expressing the mind of God in helping uh, his audience, the people that he's writing to, uh, both the Jews and the Gentiles, seeing, uh, helping them see that faith is more important than, you know, keeping the law or uh, any kind of rituals or even circumcision. Okay, so that is what we looked at in um, um, verses 1 to um, verses um, uh, 12 in verses... Uh, uh, 9 to 12, we, we, he talks about, you know, that uh, Abraham was justified by faith or made righteous by faith even before circumcision. And uh, we also saw that in verses 13 to 16, uh, he receives the promises uh, because, you know, he believed in faith. Uh, it was through grace by faith. And we talked about a little about grace uh, what are the aspects of grace? And then um, uh, in verses 14, uh, sorry, verses 17 to 21, you know, he talks about the steps of uh, Abraham, okay? Um, and we see in, in verses 17 to 21, uh, the Holy Spirit summary of Abraham's life of faith, okay? Uh, this is where we stopped last week, right? Uh, we stopped at verse 17, yes? Yes, no? Yes, okay. Okay, so we'll move on from uh, verse, we'll move on to verse 17. Now, in verses 17 to verse 21, he gets into the faith of 
uh, Abraham. Okay, uh, can somebody read verses 17 to 21, please? As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. For him, he is in it. Even God who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. Who again hope believe in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And they not weak and faint, consider not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of the prayer. Thank you, Asha. Okay. Um, so in this verse, it was very interesting uh, because in verse 17 to 21 is the Holy Spirit summary of Abraham's life of faith. Now, why do I say it's a Holy Spirit's summary of Abraham's life of faith? It's because the Holy Spirit is basically inspiring or giving the revelations of the truth uh, to Paul, it's the, you know, we know 2 Timothy 3.16 says, you know, all scriptures inspired uh, by God. Okay, so it's the Holy Spirit inspiring Paul to write. And notice in these verses, there is no mention of Abraham's struggles or mistakes. Okay, uh, it's, it's not talking anywhere about his mistakes or struggles. Uh, it's just talking about you know his faith so if he did not read the old testament if he did not read uh, genesis you know uh, then and we just read these verses that paul is writing then we say wow you know abraham was such a man of such great faith but uh, when we read uh, his life in uh, the book of Genesis, we read that, uh, you know, he, yes, he had faith, amazing faith. He was, he's an example uh, of faith. He is a pattern of faith that we are asked to follow um, and to imbibe in our lives. Uh, but uh, we see that, you know, um, there's no mention of uh, Paul, uh, sorry, Abraham's struggles or mistakes. Okay. Uh, and, but we know that, you know, Abraham did, uh, uh, you know, uh, make mistakes. He did commit mis uh, mistakes, uh, but he was also a man of great faith. When God asked him to leave his father's household, he stepped out in faith. Uh, but we also see that he made mistakes twice. He was afraid for his own life, and he said a partial life, a lie, which is a lie. A partial lie is a lie, okay, about his wife that she is my sister. Uh, we also know when we read Genesis chapter 15 that, uh, you know, he was tired of waiting for God's uh, promise to come to pass. Uh, it was 15 years since God promised him that he will have a son and there has been no sign of a son. Uh, you know, it's been 15 years of his journey of faith and, you know, uh, that is the promise has not yet come true. And then he's telling God in Genesis chapter 15, did you mean that, you know, I'll have a son through Sarah or uh, through others? You know, Eliezer, my servant, who's, you know, others around me are having uh, children, having sons. So are you going to choose one of them uh, who's going to, you know, uh, fulfill the promise um, of, uh, you know, of the generations to come who will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashore. That's when we see that God cuts a covenant with uh, Abraham, you know, uh, and God tells him, no, it's from your own womb, uh, Sarah's own womb, that, you know, you will have a, a son. Um, you know, we also see that after Genesis 15, you know, uh, uh, Abraham was prompted by Sarah, you know, and... Uh, we see that uh, Abraham thought he waited a long time and he thought maybe God meant that he should have a son through someone else or anyone else in his household. And so he births Ishmael through Hagar. Uh, in spite of God telling him in Genesis chapter 5, 15, when he presented his doubts to God, he laid it before God, God said it's not through anyone else, but it's through Sarah's own womb, you will have a son you know, yet we see after Genesis 15 that he gives in into Sarah's prompting. Um, maybe he's, Abraham thought he waited for a long time and he thought, you know, maybe God meant that he'll have a son through anyone in his household. So he births Ishmael through 
Hagar. So from scripture, we see that Abraham's uh, life of faith was not a perfect one. But now when the Holy Spirit is looking back at Abraham's life, he's not mentioning about his failures. He's not mentioning about his low day, uh, days in life. Uh, so this is a powerful lesson that we can uh, learn in our lives as well. That you know, when we journey this journey of faith, when we journey this walk of faith, as we are asked to, you know, walk the faith of Abraham, we may have ups and downs in our lives, but God wants us to keep going. You know, and ultimately we journey into that place of perfect. Faith. And this is what happened in Abraham's life, you know. Uh, yes, he started out in faith, but we see, you know, uh, through his journey of faith, there were low points in his life, times of failure when he made choices based on his own uh, decisions in his own flesh. And um, uh, but we see that, you know, through all of this, God was journeying him into a place of perfect faith. So why do I say that God is taking him uh, uh, to into a, this journey of perfect faith is uh, what we see in Abraham's life. And, you know, when I was born, the son of promise that Abraham had to wait for 25 long years, you know, when he was 75 years, God gives him this promise. So when he was 100, that, you know, his body was good as dead, that, you know, he gives, um, um, uh, you know, they have, Ish, uh, sorry, they have Isaac. And um, we see that when Isaac uh, grows up, he's a son of promise. You know, uh, Mo, uh, Abraham is excited, but God tells uh, him to go and offer up his son as a sacrifice. And what does Abraham do? No questions asked. Uh, you know, the very next day, he takes the wood, he takes the fire, he takes two servants, he takes Isaac. He goes to the place that God says, I will show you where you have to uh, offer, uh, you know, um, Isaac as a sacrifice. And, um, you know, he was convinced and he, he, he you know, takes uh, Isaac he, when he's going to offer him up as a sacrifice. You know, uh, I'm sure all along Abraham was convinced that even if he offered Isaac up to God as a sacrifice, God could raise him up from the dead, okay? Uh, and we read this in Hebrews, okay? He came to that place of perfect uh, faith in God, that uh, he knew that even if he's going to offer up his son, um, uh, a son of promise that God had waited and, uh, you know, had God, God had promised and he had to wait for, you know, uh, 25 long years, uh, we read that in Hebrews 11, verse 19, he says that he received him as though he raised him up from the dead. Uh, of course, he did not kill Isaac, but uh, we read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, where it says that, you know, um, uh, when God says, don't harm him, don't kill him, you know, uh, you know, Abraham says he received Isaac back as though he was raised up from the dead. Because maybe in Abraham's mind, he's already offered up Isaac as a sacrifice. You know, he was dead, but then he receives him back as though he was raised up from the dead. So as far as Abraham and God were concerned, it was as though a resurrection had taken place. It was not literally a resurrection, but in their minds, because... Uh, you know, imagine this uh, this father going to offer up his son and he's thinking that, okay, his son is already dead because God requires that of him. But when God stops him, you know, it's like as if to say he's receiving his son back from the uh, dead. So far, as far as Abraham was concerned, Isaac was good as dead and it was from the dead that he received him back. And this was kind of, uh, you know, uh, something that pointed out the future of uh, you know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we see that, you know, now Abraham had come to that place where he was fully persuaded that God would fulfill his promise. Uh, and it did not happen overnight. It was not a smooth journey, uh, but he eventually got to that place where he was fully persuaded that God um, had, from what God had promised for his life, God will perform it, okay? So the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, is looking at this and is highlighting this for us and showing us that, 
yeah, in our journey of faith, you know, we will not be perfect. We will have our ups and downs. There are times when we will give in to the things of our flesh. There are times when we will doubt God. Uh, but, you know, um, we can all journey and come to that place of mature faith where God wants uh, us to be, where he sees us. Uh, to be where it says, you know, um, that we will f that we are fully mature in the fullness of Christ. And James chapter two verse twenty two says, uh, through Abraham's work of faith, um, you know, he was made perfect. He was made mature. Okay, through Abraham's works, his faith was made perfect. His faith was made uh, mature. Okay, so it was through his works that his faith was being made perfect and mature. And so Paul is uh, telling us, encouraging us, that we too have to walk in the steps of uh, uh, the faith of Abraham. Now in verse 17, he's quoting the promise that God made to him that I, I will make you a father of um, many nations. Now God put this in the heart of Abraham. Uh, God decided that he would do this in the life of Abraham, that he was going to make him a father of many nations. It was a done thing in the heart and the mind of God. Okay, so Abraham is hearing this promise from God. And you know, who is this God? Uh, you know, this God is a God who brings back you know, uh, or gives life to the dead. He's a God who calls things uh, that are dead as though they exist, okay? So who is this God that, uh, you know, Abraham is hearing from, or Abraham is hearing this promise from God? Who is this God? This is a God uh, who gives life to the dead, and he's a God who calls things which do not exist or does not exist as though they did. Okay, so there are two things about God that we can learn about from here. Okay, God is a God who gives life to the dead. Okay, things might look dead uh, in our lives. Things look dead in Abraham's life, but he's a God who can resurrect. He's a God who can revive. He's a God who can give back life uh, to the things that seem dead, impossible in our lives. Can we say an amen to that? You know, uh, God resurrects, he revives, he gives life to things that are dead in our lives. So maybe there are things in your life where, you know, people have spoken prophetically over, uh, you have heard God speak, uh, God has said things in your life, but you have many years now, you know, um, you've not seen anything happening in those areas, and maybe you've just shelved it, or it's like a closed book for you, or it's something that you see as good as dead, but you know, uh, our God is a God who resurrects, he's a God who revives, amen? Okay, uh, we'll just look at um, a verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12. Okay, so can somebody read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12, please, for us? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12. Anyone can read that quickly, please? Hebrews 11, 12. Okay. Um, therefore, from, uh, from one man and, and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in a uh, multitude innumerable as the sun which is by the seashore. Thank you, Kung. Uh, just look at this uh, beautiful language uh, that is here for us. It says, from one man who is good as dead, from such a man came generations, generations as many as the stars in the sky and the sand in the seashore. Generations that are so innumerable that you can't even keep a count of because we can't count the stars in the sky or the sand on the seashore. So it says from one man comes a nation that is innumerable. So this is actually telling us something about God and how he works in our lives. Things in our lives, situations in our life are as good as dead. 
but God releases something huge, something big, something unimaginable. And that is what he did in Abraham's life. Now, how did Abraham uh, position himself to see that? Okay, this is what uh, Paul goes on to explain um, uh, in the upcoming verses. Okay, before we look at that, you know, uh, we need to remember that when God speaks His promise, uh, His promises to our hearts, uh, we need to keep uh, two things in mind. Uh, he is basically inviting us to believe in Him uh, as the one who gives life to the dead. Uh, so even if our situations look hopeless and helpless, it's not a problem to God that it looks hopeless and dead and, you know, there's no life. Um, uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, we need to believe in Him uh, who's made this promise and the one who gives life to the dead. So something that we can keep in mind when God gives us His promise. And also, second thing is God calls things that do not exist as though they did, okay? Um, it's not there, but God says it is there, okay? And uh, we can tell God, God, we still haven't uh, seen it, okay? Uh, we still haven't become what you are asking us of or what are you calling us. But God says, I have made you, okay? Uh, for example, we can look at ourselves and say, God, you know, I am weak. Uh, but God looks at us and says, you know, I have made you strong, okay? We are we, we're still weak. We can't feel his strength. But God is telling us that, you know, I have made you strong. Uh, and he's, uh, because he's, he calls things that, that does not exist as though they did. Okay. We can look at ourselves and say, God, you know, uh, I'm not a conqueror. You know, I've failed. Uh, but God looks at us and says, I have made you more than a conqueror. You know, so we can say, God, I've not become uh, what you're calling me, what you're saying of me, what you're speaking over my life. I can't see that. Uh, but God says, I've already made you that. It's already done in the spiritual realm. We just, you know, believe that uh, we step out in faith. Uh, we, uh, you know, cooperate with God. We take hold of what he has taken hold of us. And, you know, uh, we believe that to come to pass in our natural. So God is telling Abraham, you know, I will make you a father of many nations. And he's saying that uh, your, na your generations would be as uh, innumerable as the stars in the sky, sand on the seashore. You know, uh, Abraham is saying, God, I don't even have one son. I've not even arrived at that place where I'm a father, leave alone being a father of many nations. Uh, but God is telling Abraham, you know, you've not arrived there, but that is what I've made you to be. That is who you will be. You know, so sometimes in life, you know, God speaks things in our lives. He calls things in our life. Uh, he decrees things in our life. Um, we receive prophetic words. We don't see ourselves being there. But, uh, you know, we believe by faith because God who has made it, you know, can bring things to life. When he has said it, he's already seen it um, even before Abraham was born, even before the foundations of the earth. He had this promise in mind for Abraham. He's already seen his generations. He's, you know, we live in 2022, but he's already seeing the years uh, that are in the future, and he's seen the many nations, the innumerable uh, generations of um, Abraham. So one thing that, uh, you know, we can learn from Abraham's life is, um, you know, uh, Abraham, you know, God says, I want to you, I want to start calling you who I made you to be, okay? And I want you to start calling yourself who I made you uh, to be. And that's why we see that even before Abraham became the father of many nations, you know, God changed his name from Abram to Abraham, you know, the father of many nations. Okay, he changes his uh, uh, wife's name, uh, Sariah, to Sarah, you know, uh, you know, uh, somebody who's the mother of, uh, you know, generations to uh, come. So he's saying, you know, start calling yourselves what I have made you to be, okay? So God is saying, even before you see it, believe it. And, uh, you know, uh, even before you see it, you know, uh, start calling yourself that. So we start declaring over our lives what God has made us to be, who he has portioned us to be, who he's decreed us to be, okay? Um, in the spiritual realm, 
that is something that is a done completed thing in the heart and mind of God um, but you know what God has planned in our lives we need to start declaring it over our lives so that we can see what is already done in the spiritual realm uh, becoming uh, a done thing in the natural realm that we are living so when he speaks his promises uh, over Abraham's life when he see, speaks promises over our lives he's calling something to existence that does not exist okay but for God it's already completed it's already done it's already existing okay but for us it's it's not in come into existence and he's saying this is what I made you to be okay I made you to be the father of many nations and this is where you will be you will get there someday so we need to join together in our journey with the with God in our faith journey with God and um, you know say God you know I don't see things coming in the natural but I just believe I'm journeying towards where you are taking me to be uh, you know what you decreed uh, for me or what you planned for me to be so how did Abraham journey into that how did Abraham journey into the promise that God gave him that I have made you a father of many nations is um, uh, what we read in um, uh, verse 18 following okay um, in verse 18 uh, we see that um, uh, in verse 18 you know he says uh, who contrary to hope in hope believed so that we uh, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken so shall your descendants be the first thing Abraham had to do was uh, there was no reason for him to have hope but he had hope and he just did not have that hope but he believed okay uh, hope is quite different from belief and faith uh, hope is important uh, hope and uh, believing are not the same things uh, hope is basically having a desire for something uh, it's uh, it's hoping something in the future okay, that will happen uh, you desire something to happen in the future but faith uh, and belief which is you know goes uh, synonymously you know, faith and belief is something that we believe in the now that will happen here in the now so that's why the definition of faith is the substance of things hoped for which means I'm hoping for something uh, but my faith is a substance of that which means that faith is a reality okay the faith is a reality is a substance of what I am hoping for hope is out in the future I cannot see that okay but my faith is a substance of it okay uh, for example you know uh, this water bottle uh, I can see it okay it's a substance it's a solid matter okay hope is something in the future which we are hoping for that we will see but faith is a substance which means we see it in reality it's 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 like this it's something solid it's something that I can see it's something that I can take hold of so faith is a reality the substance of what I'm hoping for hope is in the future uh, I cannot see it but faith is a substance that means I begin to see it it's 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 substance it's it's uh, it's something that I can see I can view it I can I can feel it uh, so my faith is saying I got it it's here uh, it's in my heart but you know in in reality it's something that is happening in the uh, future so there was no reason why Abraham uh, could have such hope you know uh, that he will be the father of many nations when he's already 75 and there's 15 years have passed since the promise was given to him there's no sign of the promise he reaches 100 you know uh, uh, he has that hope that he will be a father but he believed so faith and belief you know uh, is uh, is something that's the same because it comes from the same root word so we can use it interchangeably uh, so faith is something that we you know we can't see but you know we believe that it's here we can experience uh, and hope is not faith because hope is something that uh, we desire something to happen way in the future but faith and belief is now okay faith is a substance of things hoped for that means something uh, we hope for in the future but 
here right now you know it's a substance it's, it's matter it's something that we can take hold of uh, we can see it in faith we believe that it's going to happen we we've got it it's here in our heart it's just to translate into uh, something that happens in reality in the natural realm that is all something that is a done thing in the spiritual realm okay so if god speaks a word in our life even though there is no reason for us to have hope you know we just believe by faith okay against all hope it says against all hope abraham believed and that is how he became the father of many nations okay he was a father of many nations to so hope something that would happen in the future but he took hold of it right now in the present. He believed God and, you know, he had that promise fulfilled. He became the father of Isaac and uh, he believed that, you know, when God could give him a son when he was 100, he could uh, create through him generations in the future, uh, which was innumerable as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the sea. So, so something that is way in the future, but, you know, something that he took hold of that promise here and now in his heart, okay? Uh, the second thing we see is in verse 19. Um, verse 19 says that, uh, we just read that, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Okay, so the second thing that we learn is in um, uh, in verse um, 19. He did not let his faith be weakened by considering the natural. Okay, yes, the natural was there. He was, uh, his body was good as dead. Sarah was... Uh, you know, um, I think almost 75 years or 80 years, and he was 100. There was no way it's humanly impossible in the natural to have um, a, a son, a child. Uh, yes, they could not deny those facts, you know. Uh, yet it says, you know, it. Uh, this did not let uh, Abraham's faith be weakened. His faith was not weakened by considering the natural okay so this teaches us uh, something that when we focus on the natural you know it tends to weaken our faith our faith gets weakened uh, it prevents a uh, faith uh, the seeds of faith being activated in our life uh, the seeds of faith in our life are also you know being weakened when we focus on the natural but when we you know focus on the promise of god you know the seeds of faith in our life are activated uh, we know that you know a seed when you look at a seed it looks as good as dead it has no potential it has no life but the very seed uh, when you have the faith and we take it and plant it in the ground that this seed is going to become a plant, a tree, it's going to bear the fruit or the flowers that I'm looking for. It's something way in the future. It's a hope that is something way in the future. But right now, in, in the eyes of faith, we are already beginning to see this plant, this tree with fruits, the fruits that we like or the, the flowers that we uh, we want. It's becoming already a substance for us here now uh, in the present. Okay, but if you say, okay, if I'm not, I'm not going to plant the seed, I do not know whether it's going to uh, yield food or yield uh, flowers, um, it's of no use, I'll just leave it. Then you're not taking hold of uh, the seed of promise that has been given to us, okay? Uh, because we're looking at the things in the natural. The things in the natural can weaken our faith, it gets our faith weakened, uh, you know, but when we focus on the promise of God, you know, that's when the seeds of faith in our life is activated. And, um, you know, that's what God did with Abraham in Genesis uh, 15, you know, when he was having a low point in his life, you know, he's waited for almost uh, uh, 85 years and there's no son of promise. And, uh, you know, um, uh, he tells God, God, are you really saying that I'm 
Sarah and me are going to have a son or is it going to be through, you know, somebody in our household? Uh, you know, Abraham was in a low point in his life, a low time in his life uh, when he thought he and Sarah will not have a son and it could be through somebody else in his household. What does God do? You know, he takes Abraham out. Uh, it was night time. He asked him to come out of his tent. He asked him to look at the stars in the sky, you know, and he asked him to count it. And of course, Abraham is saying, God, you know, I'm not able to count the stars in the sky. And then God tells him that's how many your descendants will be. So God is actually taking this whole conversation of Abraham's doubt, his low time, his uh, questioning whether they will have a son or to somebody in his household. He's taking this conversation, he's helping Abraham and taking him to look at, uh, you know, taking his eyes away from the natural that it's impossible for him and Sarah to have a son uh, and taking him to fix his eyes on the promise that God is giving him. And so he's changing his focus. Focus here is look at me, God. You know, look at me. I'm so old. Look at Sarah. She's so old. How can we have a son? And God is, you know, you know, taking this conversation, taking his focus away from the natural uh, to, you know, Come on, Abraham, count the stars, you know, count the sand on the seashore. He says, I can't, God, you know, and God is saying, you know, that many will be your uh, descendants. Um, you know, so when we feel that our faith is being weakened, uh, we need to check where we are focusing our eyes on. Are we focusing our eyes on what the doctor is saying, what medicine is saying, the medical world is saying, what situation is saying? Or are we focusing on the natural? Are we focusing on our failures, uh, the failures in the past? Uh, you know, uh, or are we, are we focusing on the promise what God has given to us? So when we take hold of God's promise what He's given to us, then you know um, our faith will not be weakened by the natural, and we can believe God. And we see that Abraham believed God. And he's not here now to see his generations that are innumerable, but he all he before he saw it in hope, you know, he believed in faith. He took the substance of what uh, he hoped for. It became a reality. He took hold of it in his heart and his mind. And, um, you know, uh, it was a promise that God fulfilled in and through Abraham. Now we'll move on to verse 20. Verse 20, he says, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Okay? He did not let unbelief come in his way. Abraham did not allow unbelief to come in his way. Now we always have a choice. Uh, you know, we have two options. I have the promise of God, and I have what you know the world is telling me, the natural world is telling me, my logical mind is reasoning, is understanding. Uh, who do I want to believe? Okay, you can either believe the promises of God, or you can believe what your logical mind is reasoning, is asking you to believe, think. Uh, uh, but we say see here that you know he did not waver at the promise of God. And because he did not waver in his promise of God, what happened to Abraham as a result of that was he was strengthened in faith and he gave glory to God. He was strengthened in his faith. His faith journey in God grew stronger and we see ultimately where it came to. He was willing to take his only son of promise and willing to sacrifice it at, uh, with this whole hope or this whole faith that God is, you know, able to, will be able to raise up his son, resurrect his son back from the dead. That is the faith that he journeyed, that Abraham journeyed into. And that is a faith that, you know, that's why he, he did not waver. He did not say, God, you gave me the son. You asked me to prom, you know, uh, sacrifice him. Is, uh, am I hearing you right? Are you speaking to me or, you know, but he just goes the next day. And he does what God, because he knows that God can, you know, keep his promise that he can even resurrect his son back from the dead. That is the, uh, you know, faith that he had journeyed into. And we see that he was strengthened in his faith, giving glory to God. Now, scripture does not record for us in Genesis, you know, that um, Abraham, how he glorified God, or he glorified God basically means worship God, praised him, gave him thanks. But, you know, I can just imagine in my mind, you know, Abraham saying, Father, I thank you. 
that you know you made me the father of nations he's not made him yet the father of even one but he's saying father i thank you you know i have this hope and this faith that you have made me the father of many nations you know we can even uh, imagine abraham praising and thanking god say father i thank you that the seed that you promised is mine it's not through my household but it's through mine the seed you promised sarah and me is yours i thank you for that father no you are faithful uh, to keep um, your promise i thank you god i thank you in advance for the son that will be uh, born to sarah and me in this household i thank you in advance that my descendants is going to be as numerous innumerable as the stars in the sky and the star in the sand on the seashore now of course this is not recorded for us in scripture okay but this is what scripture tells me here that you know, uh, uh, Paul is writing and he's writing to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he's saying that, you know, he gave glory to God, which means Abraham did give glory to God. He did uh, praise God and uh, uh, thank him. So when we don't waver in our promises of God and, uh, you know, we believe God, you know, we will be strengthened in our faith and we will give thanks and glory to God even before we see the promise coming to fulfillment. Even before we see it in our natural eyes, we've taken hold of it in our in our faith, in our in our hearts, in our in the sun. And we're saying, God, I thank you that I see this is a done thing because you are going to do it because you have promised it, and you will be you will be faithful to keep your uh, promise. And he says that you know, um, uh, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to. Uh, Perform. So Abraham comes to this place of full conviction of faith that uh, uh, that his faith was fully mature and made perfect. So Abraham came to that place of being fully convinced of the promise of God, that what God promised he will be faithful to do it. Okay, and then in verses uh, seven, that is the you know, beautiful summary that uh, Paul brings about in verses 17 to 21, a beautiful summary of Abraham's faith um, uh, and the key things that he did. Uh, and this is something that we can follow. And Paul is saying, this is how we need to walk in uh, faith. And this is how, you know, as we walk in this faith, when you journey in this faith, we'll come to this place of mature, perfect faith. And then he goes on talk. Uh, talking about righteousness by faith in Jesus uh, in verses 22 to 25. I'll just read it. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Okay, so what's the 23 to 25, the story of Abraham, it's not just for him, but for us also, because God is giving each one of us, you know, righteousness through faith. We will be made righteous. That means we will be made blameless. We will be made uh, 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 without any sin, uh, faultless before God, it's because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is imputed, put into our account uh, through faith. And then Paul, you know, beautifully moves on from uh, pointing out to Abraham to pointing us to Jesus now. He says, you know, Jesus was crucified for our sins. He was crucified for our wrongdoings. He was raised because of our justification, okay? Uh, very important here, verse 25, he says, was, Jesus was raised because of our justification, which means that the righteousness of Jesus is a pronunciation or it's a pronouncement of our justification, which means that the resurrection of Jesus, sorry, is, which means the resurrection of Jesus is the pronounce, uh, pronouncement of our justification. Okay, the resurrection of Jesus is, is, uh, is basically attesting to the fact that we have been justified. Okay, which means with the resurrection of Christ, the case is closed. Okay, the case is closed. We have been acquitted. Uh, we have been declared 
not guilty. Uh, so just to give you an example, uh, you can imagine this court where the criminal is standing uh, in the in his place, uh, uh, you know, because he has done something wrong. The charges have been brought against him, and uh, he has, uh, you know, proved to be guilty. He's been proved to. Uh, doing the wrong, uh, proved being a criminal. And so, you know, um, the punishment, the judge makes a punishment, uh, says the punishment he has to uh, uh, to do is he has to pay, you know, 50,000 rupees for the wrong that he has done. Okay, so that is the uh, pronouncement of, um, uh, you know, the uh, punishment for his mistake and then you know just imagine somebody walks in with a receipt and says you know the 50,000 is you know being paid for this person it's already being paid uh, for this person so the judge has no option but just to declare this person who is a criminal now to be free okay and then he just takes his uh, you know whatever he has that anvil or something, and he just taps it or hits it and says, you know, case dismissed, case closed. This person is free. He is no longer a criminal. Okay, why? Because, you know, somebody has uh, taken the, paid the, the punishment that he has to pay for, 50,000 rupees, it's being paid, the case is closed. So the same way, you know, we uh, stand justified before God as criminals, um, but, you know, Jesus has paid uh, the punishment for our sins on the cross. And, uh, you know, he's, Jesus says, Father, the punishment for this person, for Selina, has already been paid. And all that God the Father can say, case closed, case dismissed. You know, uh, Selina is free. Okay. So the resurrection of Christ you know, actually brings the case to the close. You know, we've been acquitted. We have been declared not guilty. So the resurrection of Jesus is a pronouncement of our justification, of our righteousness. The resurrection of Jesus is attesting to the fact that we have been uh, justified. So when we were pronounced free, uh, you know, Christ's resurrection Took place. That's just basically what it means. So when we have been pronounced guilt-free, guiltless, faultless, blameless, you know, it's as if Christ's resurrection has taken uh, place. Or we can say that Christ's resurrection is the announcement of our justification. We can say when Christ was resurrected, it means that we were announced as justified, as righteous in God's sight. So he was. Uh, so we can say that Christ. Resurrection is the announcement of our justification. He was raised because of our justification. That means that resurrection is the announcement of our justification. There's no more worrying about the charges that have been, uh, you know, have leveled against us because Christ has been raised from the dead. Because Christ has been raised from the dead, we are justified. We stand justified in God's sight, faultless and uh, blameless. Now we see that's how beautifully Paul, you know, has spoken so far about uh, Abraham's faith, and now he's changing that and bringing our attention and drawing our attention to Jesus. He's changing our focus to what Christ did in order to justify us, because he's going to move on into chapter four, where the focus is going to be on Christ, what he did, uh, the grace of God. Uh, and the righteousness by faith that we receive. He's putting all this together in the person of uh, Christ. So basically faith, righteousness, and the grace uh, you know, of God will be seen in the light of what Jesus has done for us. And he's so beautifully bringing in Jesus here because he's going to transition into this in chapter 5 where he's going to focus on what Christ did, the grace of God, and the righteousness by faith, and he's putting all this together in the person of Christ. And Paul is going to talk about how faith, righteousness, and grace can be seen in the light of what uh, Jesus has done for us. Okay. So, any questions um, in chapter four? This brings us to the end of chapter four. How beautifully Paul, you know, talks about Abraham's faith. 
and then he talks about uh, you know moves on to Jesus Christ where he's going to discuss about this in chapter 5 yes Kennedy you have a question thank you thank you very much teacher Selena what I wanted to just find out is it correct to assume that uh, Abraham and Isaac are foreshadowed of Jesus Okay, uh, that's a good question. Is an Abraham and Isaac a foreshadow of uh, uh, Jesus? Not exactly, uh, uh, but yeah, what you know, uh, when Abraham was asked to you know uh, sacrifice Isaac, you know, um, you know, it was actually foreshadowing the resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that he would make. On the cross, uh, but one way, yes, but uh, they are not typically those who are foreshadowing what uh, you know uh, about Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you. Thank yes. You have another question? You have another question, Kennedy? Mm, because what you uh, what you have. Uh, what yes, I, I, I did end. say. Yes, I did say. As far as Abraham uh, was concerned, you know, Isaac was good as dead, and it was from the dead that he received him back. Uh, in a manner, it actually prefigured the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, it was something that you know, it was something that was pointing out uh, for, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, that God would raise him back from the dead. Thank you, Arisma. Yes. Thank you, Kennedy. Somebody else had their hand up? Anyone else has any question? No questions? I hope the explanation was clear. Was it clear? Anything else that uh, you didn't understand, you want me to explain again, I can do so in the next class because we've run out of time. Were you able to understand everything that was explained? Yes, no? Hello, class, no response? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, only from Kennedy? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes. thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, Rupa. Okay. Okay, we'll uh, end class. Thank you all for um, joining class. Have a blessed uh, Friday and a blessed weekend. Uh, God bless you all. Okay, see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you.